You see the shirt I wear? Oh, today? that's dope. That's dope. Wait, what is what does it say? Is that Virginia HBCU? Union? There yeah. we go. Virginia yeah, Union. I was looking at Virginia, Virginia Union. Union. Yeah, no doubt. All right, Shout HBCU. Out and, and Mike, look, it's HBCU week, and it's appropriate that uh, it, it was started uh, back in 1980 by Jimmy Carter, who would think about all the things that Jimmy Carter was. Not only was he a Southerner, uh, he's a man of letters, and he's a man of faith. So uh, Jimmy Carter, when he got to the White House in 1976, he had a lot of people in the Atlanta and, and Georgia area in general who really he relied on. And one of the people, I don't know if you know this, one of the people who had a direct line to, to Jimmy Carter in the White House was Martin Luther King Sr. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. MLK Sr. would call him up and say, hey, Mr. President, we got to talk. And, and, and one, there's one famous story where he called he called uh, the, the White House. And he was like, is the president busy? <laughs> and he's like, uh, no, he no, can't. Not, uh, no, not really. <laughs> uh, uh, da Daddy King, Daddy King, he can't talk to you right now. Well, all right, well, tell him to call me back then. Right. So uh, right. it's, it's HBCU week, and we know how uh, significant this week is. It's, it's a very important week. You know, you think about uh, the history of HBCUs. The first one, Cheney University in, in Pennsylvania, uh, just right outside of Philadelphia, started in 1837. And that is, just to put that in context, that is almost like 200 years after Harvard. So think about that. Mm. First HBCU, 1830s, Harvard and Princeton and Yale uh, started hundreds of years uh, earlier. So I'm just glad that we're in a yeah. space now that we can talk about it. And there are a lot of wonderful things, as you know, that are associated with HBCUs. Yeah, no, man. Um, you know, I've always had a special relationship with the HBCU community. I mean, because now you went to Point Park College in Point Pittsburgh. Point Park. Not, yes. not an HBCU. All right? Not an HBCU. I went to I went to Loyola University in New Orleans. Definitely not an HBCU. In fact, we had a corner of the student student union that we dubbed Africa because all 15 of us used to hang out there. All right. So yes, no, not, <laughs> we had a black student union. But Which we were part? not at HBCU. <laughs> Which part of Africa were y'all claiming? Are y'all claiming the whole continent? <laughs> We're going to take everything. Uh, we didn't have enough people to represent the whole continent. But anyway, um, yeah, so, but uh, growing up in New Orleans, practically my entire family went to Xavier, uh, Xavier University in New Orleans. Um, yeah. A lot of friends from my high school went to Southern University in Baton Rouge. Uh, a few went to FAM uh, in, in Tallahassee. Uh, I felt like I went to an HBCU because McDonough 35 Senior High School was the first all-black high school in New Orleans. So I had I was at a I went to all black schools throughout my uh entire uh, you know primary education or, or and secondary education before I went to uh before I went to college. Um so I felt like I had something of an HBCU experience. Something of. I, I know I didn't get the real thing, but I felt like I had something of it. And then because of the money and the journalism program. Uh, and at the end of the day, I decided to stay home uh, in New Orleans and go to school. Um, but also, too, man, just another, we, we're talking about, you know, actual HBCUs. And, I mean, we could literally spend a month, you know, just on the content that comes from the stories of the significance and the individuals that have been produced by HBCUs. And our HBCUs have helped shape this country's history, uh, not just for black people, but America as we know it. Um, I want to shout out a, a fictional HBCU. Because uh, I'm 41, which means, yep. uh, you know, I was in my formative years in the 90s. I mean, who didn't watch A Different World and dream about going? You couldn't tell me Hillman wasn't real. When it was time for me to apply <laughs> to colleges, I was looking for, like, well, where's Hillman College? I mean, because Hill A Different World, and one of the greatest uh, treats of my, of my career was, you know, uh, at ESPN when I was able to reenact or be a part of reenacting The Different World Open the one that Aretha Franklin sang. Um, oh, yeah. You know, and that, and that yeah. opened with, with the embrace and reunite the original cast of A Different World. But just to be able to thank them, to be able to thank them for just the example that they set for me. Because if you think about A Different World and what it meant for the culture and what it meant for HBCUs, I mean, it, it, it allowed me to, 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 to view college uh, and yeah. college for black people in a, in a positive light. So I wanted to go to HBCU because of Hillman college uh and yeah, in my years yeah, of watching Mike. a different world 7 30 central on thursdays 
<laughs> in there New it Orleans. Is. You know, a yeah. lot of people, a lot of people needed that affirmation uh, that you talked about. A lot of people just wanted to, from their from their early educational experiences, even before they had the language, to articulate what they were feeling. They were feeling something. Yeah. If if you weren't if you weren't uh, privileged enough to go to one of these schools, or you saw a lot of people who looked like you, or pe or you were taught by those who looked like you, if you weren't in that and you weren't in that situation. At times, school could be uh, a very isolating experience. So exactly what you mm -hmm. said about the fictional uh, Hillman College and in a different world. All right, but think about that. Before A Different World, that was a spinoff of The Cosby Show. Oh, I know he's yeah. been canceled, rightfully so. I know, I got it. Right. But well, before we knew... All he did was rep HBCUs. Yeah, yeah before we knew yeah. who Bill Cosby really was, uh, we knew on The Cosby Show... And every week, I mean, there'd be some sweatshirt. You'd see something like Spellman, and then you'd see Wilberforce. So what's that? Central State, all of, Grambling, and you know, all over. He was not only representing uh, HBCUs on NBC, but also uh, donating significant amounts, uh, significant amounts of money to these schools. He did a lot uh, for historically black colleges and universities. So did Spike Lee. Uh, Spike Lee, who was an HBCU well, grad, Morehouse. Morehouse. Yeah. Morehouse. Yeah. So he did a lot. And there was some controversy. I remember it at the time when, when school days came out. Uh, and so <laughs> half pipe. <Yeah. laughs> yeah. Half pipe. Yeah. You're not my cousin yeah. anymore. You're not my cousin. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Big brother. All Wake Mike. up. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Lawrence Fishburne. Yeah. You think about that cast, though, by the way, Mike. The cast, incredible. Like all, oh, look, uh, look at a lot of Spike's movies. His early movies. Oh anybody who was anybody. Yeah. Wow. Anybody who was anybody. Wow. Yeah. But he did a lot for it. I, mean, I was talking to, uh, talking with my wife about this the other day. Uh, she, she's a little younger than I am, slightly, slightly younger than I am. So she's saying she she said when she saw uh, School Days, she was so young she thought, okay, maybe this is a Hollywood <laughs> representation of this college that doesn't exist. So I think that's part of it. Right. You know, depending on where you grew up, a lot of people just don't know about these schools and they don't know the history of these schools. Like, wh why they're so significant in American history? Because they didn't exist. They didn't exist. And so you have people, you have hundreds of thousands of people in this country who had no, had no educational outlets and it was il even illegal uh, early for them to even learn. And so yeah. because of because of a lot of churches uh, and a lot of uh, brave people, a lot of strong people who were dedicated to their communities, this is how uh, HBCUs started. Yeah. And, 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 and after and 1837, just kept popping up. You are, you, you are so professorial. It's really incredible. Like, every time you speak <laughs> and you're teaching, uh, you're, you're like a lesson plan. Uh, a walking lesson plan is what you are. No, but we've also, I mean, just even in recent months, had something of an ongoing um, celebration of HBCUs, given our knock on wood future vice president of the United States, but for now, vice presidential nominee Kamala Harris, pride of HU, the Mecca, not to mention the late great Chadwick Bozeman. So, you know, you have a lot of attention and the spotlight was was paid um you know to, to Howard University in particular but HBCUs in particular in general excuse me you know and the divine nine even the fraternities and sororities that got a lot of attention and people you know hopefully were curious enough to look into it and look into the people that they produced and like I said man even though you know uh, I didn't attend an HBCU I might as well have because uh, right. <laughs> I, well, I had a girlfriend hey, hey, at Southern. Same. I had a girlfriend at Southern. You best believe I was at Southern's homecoming. You best believe I was at the Bayou Classic every Thanksgiving weekend growing up in New Orleans. Um, let, you know, let me just, let me just point out. Let me adult. just help you. Yeah. Let me help you. Let me help yeah. you here for help a second. Help me out. Help me out. Help me out. You, you, help me. Help you, me you didn't. You didn't have. You didn't have a. You, you got your first girlfriend when you were in your mid twenties. That was your first girlfriend. You had no history. <laughs> don't keep... no, no girlfriend. <laughs> What are you talking no, about? I, mean, listen, I, 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 I appreciate, I understand. I appreciate, I understand what, you're, what you're talking about. I appreciate what you're trying to do. I appreciate what you're trying to do. But let's just say my wife ain't married no amateur. So, you know, she, she knows that I brought some experience. It's real, me. brother, let's from another on a Friday. Let's just put it on that a Friday. way. Let's I just love put it. That way. Hey, man, listen, I want to I wanna show some love, and I want to bring in a couple of brothers who did attend HBCUs, and not just any HBCU, the Mecca, 
Howard University. I want to bring in a couple of brothers who I got so much love for, and that is Jim Trotter and Jim Steve Trotter. Weiss, both longtime NFL reporters. That's Look at these you know, dudes. They, they, these guys know the NFL inside and out, but more important, throw up the picture of their new podcast. It's called Huddle and Flow, okay? And <laughs> on this podcast, Steve Who came up with Jim, the title? Not was, only, it, was it Trotter? Was it Trotter wait, or White? So who came up with the title? Yeah, who Neither. Came, who came up with the title? Neither was producer? also a Howard man. There you go. There you go. There it is. I, I want y'all to see this. Look at this artwork. Look at this. If that ain't pimping, that is befitting of Jim Trotter and Steve Weiss right, right there. They bring 40 plus years of combined experience and they got unfiltered, entertaining conversations about issues on and off the field. And they discuss the HBCU experience both then and now and the significance of, of HBCUs and their contributions to sports and society. So let's just start there. I'll start that with you, Trot. Um, Billy D. Williams' uh, voice of yours, man. It's good to talk to you. Just, just kind of speak to the significance, first and foremost, of, of Howard University in your life and your career. Oh, I don't think we have enough time to speak to the significance in, in my life and my career. Um, you have to remember, I grew up going to predominantly white high schools and white high schools, period, or schools, period, I'm sorry. And once I got to Howard, it was... Um, I can't even begin to put in the words. I just felt at home. You know, I was at a place where I felt like I was more than a number, that the expectations for me were such that I was going to succeed. It was a nurturing atmosphere, and I loved it. And, and I can say to this day, having graduated in 1986, that if I were to do it all over again, I would be right back there. Steve, you feel Steve. the same way? Yeah, look, and, and I had the experience of going to a, a PWI, you know, predominantly white institution. For two years, I went to the University of Missouri to play football and really felt isolated. You know, and I grew up, like Jim, in a suburban town outside of St. Louis. Majority uh, white students never had, I think, but one or two black teachers my entire career before I got to college. So I transferred to Howard, and immediately it was like, whoa, okay, I, I'm not over here. I don't have to go to the two fraternity parties every week to be with black people. And so it was really, you know, the, the competition, what I'll, what I'll say is this, Howard will bring out the competition, everything, the, how you dress to go to class, <laughs> to follow <laughs> Mike was just talking about, to, to pushing you in school. So I transferred in right as Jim and Kamala were transferring out, you know, and I was there with Gus Johnson and Stan Verrett and Frederica Whitfield and Michelle Miller. I mean, Jim will tell you, I'm sure his class was just as strong, that cluster. So we were all driven competitively in so many different ways. And I think that's where the carryover into real life really happened for me. Tell me, tell me about the, uh, the, the podcast. I mean, it's a, it's a, great, it's a great title. You, neither one of you came up with the title, so I need to know who came <laughs> up with it. And... And just what, what you are looking or what you are looking uh, to get out of it. Well, our producer, one of our co-producers, Thomas Warren, came up with the name. And he's a Howard man as well. And um, we were thinking about all sorts of names. Something is, is, And Steve came up with something like, we, we got issues. And I love that. But others thought, no, nah, it's, it's a little too confrontational or the connotations aren't what you might want. Um, but really, all it is, guys. It's like you and I sitting down having a conversation and we come from a perspective that's different from some of our colleagues, our white colleagues. And so Steve and I, when I first got to NFL Network, we talked about doing a podcast and we're now in a climate where um, the league felt comfortable allowing us to do this, this, this podcast. And I couldn't be happier about it because, you know, Steve brings a certain experience, life experience. I bring a life experience and we just sit down and we talk about what's going on. And it's not just football, it's life, it's family, it's television, whatever. And, and guys, the one thing about that's really cool, when Jim talked about, we, we've been trying to do this for two years. I mean, in all honesty, we first proposed it, we were laughed out of the room. We were, mm. we, were, we were made to feel like we wasted somebody's time. And so now in this climate, when a lot of people want to pat themselves on the back for being woke and coming up with initiatives that mm. represent people, it was brought back to us. So Jim and I were like, however we get it, we're going to make it real. We're going to make it important. We're going to give voices to people who have not had them. 
we will take on the NFL, even though our employers, those are the first three letters of our employer's name. We challenge them. We have people on challenging some of Love the it. marketing machine that they're coming up with, like lift every voice and saying that's nobody asked for that. Right. So we have discussions talking about this with sports people, with non-sports people. And I got to say this about my guy, Jim Trotter, and, and you guys know this well. His ability to draw information out of people, casual conversation is uncanny. Uh, we just had a great mm -hmm. conversation with Doug Williams on HBCUs and with Deion Sanders is going to face Jackson State and with Larry Fitzgerald. And what Jim was able to really pull out of this, everybody should hear. So, look, it's a go-to yeah. if you're the same type of sports guy podcast. It's absolutely don't, don't let Steve fool y'all, man. Steve is bringing it out, too. It ain't oh, just no, me. No. It's both of us. So, <laughs> trust hey, me on that. Look. Hey, listen, you know, I got love for both of you brothers. Both of y'all have looked out for me, and I have modeled a lot of my game. I, I started out as an NFL reporter, and trust me, I was joined at the hip with Jim Trotter. Uh, and Y'all don't, wait, White, wait, so hold I, up. Got... Y'all don't know. I remember, my, first time I ever saw Michael Smith, I'm at a Raiders press conference in Alameda, and this young brother's sort of in the back of the room, and he's standing up <laughs> while everyone else is kind of fidgeting about what questions do they want to ask or should I ask this? And Mike's just like, what about this? What about this? <laughs> and I was like, this brother's going to be all right. You know, and never good. met him, didn't know. He was, he was back in Boston at the Globe. And I was like, yeah. he going to be all right. And look at him now. He's here with Michael Holly, and they both bring in game. I'm proud of you both. Absolutely. Appreciate you. And, 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 and Steve, you. everything Thank you, you just said about how it was received two years ago, you could – Take that and insert Michael and I's story. It's the same story, man. So you are same definitely story. preaching to our, our souls right there. And by the way, while we're showing love, a lot of people don't realize this. The, the conversation around Colin Kaepernick is so mainstream, if you will, or so universally accepted. It was so far removed from his original protest. People don't remember that. Steve Weiss is the person who first asked Colin Kaepernick. First asked Colin yep. Kaepernick, why were you he sitting for the National story. Anthem? And the rest is history. That's the Steve Weiss story, just in case y'all didn't know where this entire conversation started, at least the modern version of it, it started with Steve Weiss. Um, I want to ask, though, just about, you, you say you talked to Dion, excuse me, talked to Doug Williams about Dion taking the gig uh, at Jackson State. Steve, for those of us who haven't had a chance to listen to the podcast yet, and again, you can find it on Apple Podcasts, um, what did Doug have to say? Be a Grambling State alum? a uh, former Grambling State coach, and most people know him as the first black quarterback to win a Super Bowl with the Washington football team back in 87, 88. What did he have to say about Dion going to Jackson State? Well, Jim and I, since we couldn't get Dion because he's got another podcast obligation, so he can't go on other people's podcasts. <laughs> um, Jim thought it was it was appropriate. Jim and I thought it was appropriate to have Doug because Doug has been, right? Doug was a household name. He started coaching at Morehouse. He went to go coach Grambling. But we talked about some of the things that Dion brings. The ability to recruit, the ability to draw spine, um, the ability to bring teams to a camp that they rarely is happening. Remember, this is what we Glenn Barney and Walter Payton and schools like that. But also, Doug had the great perspective of fundraising at HBCUs. It's very difficult because HBCUs, when people give money, they often you won't let you earmark it for an athletic program or a particular sport or whatever. So Doug was just fantastic talking about that but guys he was also very good doug is on several committees working with the nfl to increase diversity among coaching and general manager hires and, and he was exceptional talking about that because remember most hbcus are not going to play into the spring uh when it comes to football there's only one player from an hbcu drafted last year now they're going to be behind the eight ball in terms of drafting players so doug's on a committee to bring awareness to some of these draft eligible players so it's really wide ranging mm -hmm. and condensed uh, solution, but we did come up with the best answer on how owners um, can meet general manager and coaching candidates. And you guys can come with you now. Doug came up with it. Cookout. We're having a cookout at Doug Williams' house in D.C. Yeah, he Whoa. said his wife it. is going to make gumbo. I love it. So we're going to bring I'm all the owners Listen. in. Listen. A cookout. I, a cookout. I, I, hold on. Y'all got a date? Y'all got a date yet? I was going to say, what is it? Juneteenth, maybe? Juneteenth weekend? Uh, of course. Naturally. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. That's what we spend in Juneteenth. What, what owner is going to say no to a cookout on Juneteenth 
at Doug's house. Knowing that and, we, and say, if you do say no, we're going to put it out there. Exactly. Yeah, they, get to, they, get, they get the credibility. I'm invited to the cookout. They get that out of it, you know? <laughs> I, I got a couple of things for you. Uh, you know, Weiss uh, said something a few minutes ago. That, and it takes us takes me back to our first show. Our first show, we were talking about Lift Every Voice and Sing, which is such a powerful song for me and my entire family that I said, uh, I said on our first show, I'm not ready to share that. I'm not ready to share that with the nation, especially when it's going to be pulled and tugged in this uh, often uh, contentious and very silly uh, political fight. Uh, do you feel that way? Uh, how do you feel about it, Steve? And how do you feel about it, Jim? Because I, I, I'm holding on to lift every voice and sing. I don't want to share it with anybody. It's not, it's not a matter of not sharing. I mean, I'm all about educating those who want to be educated and whatnot. It was, when we're talking about police officers not being held accountable for shooting and killing unarmed black men and women, I don't need to hear uh, uh, the, the black national anthem or something that I grew up in church singing or something that my family passed. I want to hear legislators talking about changing the laws that allow hmm. these types of transgressions to continue. I don't give a damn about this. In empty stadiums, you're playing it? I mean, that's just a bat packing. To me, it's something like people patting themselves on the back, like, look at this marketing gesture we came out with. Aren't we woke now? But that's the point. I don't want, I, that's, that's what I mean. I, but I don't want it to be, and, and what you're saying is right, 100%. I don't want it to be caught up in like some marketing, uh, some shtick. It's, it's much more than stick to me. So put that aside. And as you said, you know, get to the substantive issues. How do you feel about it, Trotter? No, I feel exactly the same. Look, we have to remember it was only a year ago where the commissioner of the NFL said, we have moved on. We have moved beyond all of this. And now what do we have? We have hashtags. We have in racism in the end zones. We have the names of social justice victims on the back of helmets. We have PSAs. And then we have Lift Every Voice and Sing being played prior to the national anthem. It's like the league is trying too hard to prove that somehow it is woke and aware. As Anquan Bolden said on our podcast re re regarding the fight for social justice, just do the work. The rest will yeah. take care of itself. And unfortunately, as you guys know, the NFL is always reactionary instead of being proactive. Stop trying to get people to pat you on the back and, and show that you are woke and committed to your players. Just do the work, and the rest will speak for itself. And meanwhile, that same NFL is using a racist standard to deny players, former players, uh, claims you know for that suffer from dementia, or suffer from from brain trauma, using a racist standard to to, to reject their uh, their claims. There, um, I know you guys got to go. But let me ask you nice this, Michael. To did, take, did you, uh, did you or anyone else who has followed the NFL for all of these years think that this CTE settlement was going to resolve all of this? Because I know I didn't. Yeah. No, I, 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 I'm I never sorry. Can you repeat that? I, I lost you. What did you say? No, no. Did, did, no. Did, did, can you hear me, Mike Smith? I, I, can hear, I can hear you now, Jim. I'm sorry. I was having uh, audio issues. What did you say? I missed you. No, I was just saying that did anyone really believe that the CTE settlement was going to settle this issue? Because there yeah. are a lot of folks I've been told even back in the beginning that all of these, these review processes were going to be dragged out, and as, as morbid as this may sound, hoping that some of these players would pass away and the families would never see that money. Mm -hmm. So I'm not surprised mm -hmm. that there are these standards out there that are now inhibiting a, um, a retired player's ability to get money. Yeah, no question, no question. Yeah, sorry about that, man. My, my audio went out, dropped off for a second. So thank you for, for, uh, for, for that point. Listen, you guys were nice enough. Take time out of your busy day. Y'all got another news-breaking interview that you guys got to get to. Before we That's go, right. I got one last thing. By again, I mean regularly, okay? I want to do more of this with you guys. But two, real quick, you mentioned Doug Williams. A couple years ago, the Undefeated put out a list of the best HBCU athletes. They had Doug Williams at the top, obviously, you know, crazy performance in Super Bowl That's 22. That's crazy. Yeah, but That's crazy. Historic performance, nonetheless. I'll let them live. So, Weiss, you first, then Trotter, your greatest HBCU athlete. I know that's putting you on the spot, but greatest HBCU athlete of all time. Oh, man. It's either, to me, either Wilma Rudolph or Walter Pate. Okay. I like it. I mean, I, I'm not going to...
I'm not going to argue with Wilma, but I'm going to go the other way in football and say Jerry Rice. All right. He's the go for so a reason. Tennis, yep. So we got Tennessee State. Uh, we got Jackson State represented. Mm -hmm. And we got Mississippi Valley State represented. And HU, the pride of HU, Steve Weiss, Jim Trotter, Huddle and Flow is the podcast. Love y'all, man. Thank y'all so much for falling through. Appreciate Our you. Other brothers. Appreciate you. Appreciate y'all. Appreciate you, fellas. All right, y'all. Great man, those are two guys. I mean, those are two fun. guys. I have so much respect for them, uh, and I just uh, been doing it for a long time and doing it at a high level, Mike. As you know, high level, uh, high level. Just, hey, before before we go to break, just respect it across. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Up. Oh, for sure. No, I'll just for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, it's, and it starts with me, man. I, I, I love those dudes. They meant a lot to me personally and professionally. No, I just wanted to get your your number one. You said it was crazy for Doug Williams. I don't know that I would put Doug Williams on at number one, but I understand. You know, I get it. First black quarterback to win the Super Bowl. Obviously, went on and coached at his alma mater, Grambling State. Led for the longest time by the late, great Eddie Robinson. So who's your number one HBCU athlete of all time? Jerry Rice. Okay. Jerry Rice. But, I mean, Hands down, Jerry Rice. Our, yeah, yeah. I mean, not only the, the best wide receiver, I think he is the best wide receiver in NFL history. We agree on that? Yeah, he's probably best player. It, regardless of position, best player in the that, That's Chicago. where I was going. Okay, that's where I was going. I was going that yeah. not only is he the best wide receiver, an argument can be made that he's the best player in the history of the league. I thought that uh, up until like four or five years ago when I started saying the best player in the history of the league is Tom Brady. Because I think what you're looking at, when you go into those, and you go into that rare air, that's when we all start to nitpick, right? You're letting people behind a velvet rope you're starting to nitpick. Oh, sorry, bro. Your shoes ain't shine well enough. You know, you look pretty good, but, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know your are So I always go by elite years. How many elite seasons do, do you have? And so uh, Jerry Rice had a bunch of them, but I'd say like the last uh, three or four years of his career, okay, he started to fall off a little bit. Like Tom Brady, his first bad season, quotation fingers, first bad season, probably last year. And, he's, yeah. and and, and he's, he threw for 4,000-plus yards, right? His age 42 season, best age 42 season in the history of football is bad for Tom Brady. So he is still considered an elite quarterback in his 40s. That's why I say he's the best player of all time, but the best HBCU athlete, with all respect to Walter Payton and Wilma Rudolph and Althea Gibson and Earl well, the that's Pearl where I Monroe go. with that spin move. That's, but, that, but wait, you, that's where I got to go. That's where I got to I gotta go, Althea Gibson. Althea? First black, I got to go out. Thea Gibson, first black woman to win Wimbledon. And then, do people know that she went and joined the LPGA in 1963? But first black woman to win a single title in Wimbledon. And I also and give it to sang, Wilma Rudolph. And she sang a little bit, too. Do you know that? Yeah, there you go. But, but Wilma, I did. She was a singer. Uh, but then Wilma Rudolph, three gold medals in the, in the Rome uh, Olympics in 1960, overcame polio. So I would go with those two. But I, but I want to just share a story. It's, you want to talk about you learn something new every day. Learn something new every day. I didn't know about this. We're talking about football players. Let's talk about the original sack artist, Deacon Jones. Mm -hmm. Okay? I think he coined the term sack. He's probably the all-time sack leader. We just don't know it because they didn't record the stats until 1982. Um, South Carolina State, but only one year, because he came out of Mississippi Vocational, but he was at South Carolina State for one year. Michael, do you know why? And I, and I read this. I want to see this in several different places to make sure it's true. But do you know why Deacon Jones was only at South Carolina State for one year? The school I don't, learned I don't. of his part. The school learned of his participation in the civil rights movement and revoked his scholarship. Mm. Who knew? Who knew? I, this, I learned that. I learned that today. This is an I was I was today years old. I was today wait years wait old. Wait. When I learned to be clear. why South Carolina State revoked his scholarship. 